I'm going to stand just so I can project more easily. Okay. I see more fans are coming up. <laughs> so the competition so, yeah. is greater. <laughs> My name is Paul Carl Ainui. I also have another name, Hayden Burgess. And I am from the Waianae community. I was just asked how long you've been living up in Lua Lua Valley. We moved in 1948. And I have been there ever since. So it's been quite a while. Uh, what I want to do as I speak about the independence model, <coughs> as I speak about my thoughts on Hawaiian sovereignty, is shift the paradigm, shift the mindset. I'm not going to tell you about the overthrow, about the Americans coming in, about all of that bad stuff. You already heard that. What I want to do is talk to you about a process that we are going through. And I've been involved in the process for quite a while. In 1977, 1976, I graduated from the law school at the University of Hawaii. 1977, I represented a reputed underworld leader of Hawaii where he was charged with double murder, double kidnap. And I had just opened my law practice out next to the, the Washerette out in Waianae, right next to Dr. McKinney's office. Uh, but anyway, when he was charged with double murder, double kidnap, they asked, how do you plead, guilty or not guilty? And I responded by saying, we refuse to dignify this court by even entering a plea. <coughs> Who are you foreigners to come into Hawaii and judge our Hawaiian citizen by your foreign laws? We are not Americans. We are Hawaiians. And at that time, we used a court system to begin to educate about Hawaiian independence, Hawaiian sovereignty, the fact that we had been invaded and overthrown, and all the illegalities that now is very well known. But at that time, it would be impossible to find an audience here with this size. If there was an audience, there were maybe about three. My client, myself, and my wife. Everybody else uh, criticizing us, oh, he's just trying to escape from liability and arrest. After that, we moved to Sand Island, uh, defended Sand Island on the basis that Sand Island was also part of Hawaiian territory. After that, Makua, when Hurricane Iniki, and <laughs> you were involving that. And so we defended on that. I was uh, threatened to have my license taken away by the federal court because I said I'm not an American citizen. And so what we did was you use the judicial system as much as possible to continue with the education. In the meantime, we went into the schools, we went into the universities, we went into homes, and started talking about Hawaiian sovereignty. Today, especially when people do not know that history, it's, it seems like every generation that comes into a new cause think they invented the cause of this other, all of these things. But it's good because they engage in the discussion now. But what I want to do is follow a process that I've seen and share with you my thoughts on the process. You see, what we're really talking about, I call it decolonization. I know there's others who use the word occupation and deoccupation. For me, I disagree with them, but we can leave that aside because that's not what we're going to talk about today. The process of decolonization is more than just getting the colonizer out of the community and we take over. Because what happens when you do that? What they left back is still the, the mindset. They left back the institutions. They left back the deep culture that they ingrained in us. And as a result, we will continue to war. It's always going to be who is the dominator over that system. You look at what happened in Fiji. Independence. And then after that, you got the overthrow, the Rambuka overthrow. After that, another overthrow. Look at what is happening in Burma, what has happened in Burma. They had an election. They created a federal state, and then immediately the military came in, and for the last 40 plus years, Burma has been run by that kind of government. So it's not sufficient just to have the colonizer pull out. 
we ourselves have to get rid of our own colonization. So it's a process that we go through. The first stage that we go through is a stage I call, and all of these things you will see as notes in my handouts in the back. First stage, the stage of recovery and rediscovery. That's when we find out about the true history. Oh, what do you mean they came in and they, they weren't invited by Emilio Kalani? Different from the book that I read in the eighth grade, in which it said Emilio Kalani asked the President of the United States to help her because she didn't understand democracy. So that kind of stuff. And then as you see how they came in, they overthrew all the illegal stuff. That's the stage I call recovery and rediscovery stage. Many of us have gone through that. The second stage is what I call the mourning phase, the anger stage, the bitterness stage. You, you get so angry about what they did. For me, when I first found out, I started plotting to kill Americans. I started plotting to burn buildings, to blow up buildings. And at that time, I was a member of the US military. I was in the Air Force, at Hickam Air Force Base. And I started doing all of that plotting. That's a stage that you go into after you have been victimized but su by such a huge uh, injury that took away our nation, you know, our culture, our language, all of our history. They took all of that away. You're angry. You expect it to be. But the problem is, in the process of decolonization, is that some of us get stuck in that anger phase. Sometimes they call it the awfulizing stage. So when you hear people talk about it, they have just read the history, they have just read the Blunt Report, they have just read Cleveland's address to Congress. They're so angry that you can hear it in just a tone of their voice. You freaking so-and-so, get the hell out of here. We don't want you here and all this stuff. It's not a problem. It's an expression of the state that they are in. And we've got to allow that to happen. But the problem is we cannot get stuck in the awful lives. Because if we are going to build a new nation, we have to build it on far more than the injustices that have occurred to us. It's not only because they overthrew a king or a queen or they, they started taking our seated lands and all that stuff. And so what we're going to do is recreate a new nation. Then what? Is, is it just to replicate what our ancestors did? Our ancestors said, all you Wahinis cannot vote. Are we going to replicate that kind of stuff? No, when, when we build a nation, we got to build it on dreams that we have today. It has to fit our situation today. So it's not satisfied just to say, we should be an independent nation, and then you have all of these issues as, who's a king, who's a queen, how many nations you're going to have, and you have the shattering. More important than coming to consensus as to who the leader is going to be, is to build a common dream about who we are. And what we need to do is start practicing that dream. So that's a third stage, what I call the dreaming phase. When we start asking ourselves these questions that oftentimes we don't want to address ourselves. You remember about 30 years ago, one of the questions we didn't want to address ourselves, who are the citizens of our Hawaiian nation? Oh, you mean the house has got to be part of our citizenry? No, and leave the Japanese out because they've been controlling Hawaii and they're not treating the Hawaiians right. And what about, and then you go in and you start picking and then you end up being the racist yourself. We didn't want to face the fact that we too were part of the racist But that is what the dreaming does. It forces you <coughs> to ask those questions and then it forces you to go back History. You know what we say is not a Look to the source. What is the source? Our culture and our history. It's unavoidable. So as we build for the future, we also have to look into the past and be reasonable, be humane, try to make sense out of these things. So that today, you listen to the organizations. People generally agree that we are not here to build a Hawaiian nation made up of only the Poi Hawaii because it contradicts our whole history. A nation was overthrown, not a race, not a tribe. 
not a group of people, a whole nation. And that is what we need to reconstitute. Now, as we reconstitute the <coughs> nation, yes, we have to have special places for the the Poe Hawaii, the indigenous people, the first people of the land. But that doesn't give us a right to contradict what our ancestors said and allow others to be citizens of our nation as well. The truth is, and oftentimes we don't like to face the truth, that those who participated against Lili Okalani included Native Hawaiians. Included Native Hawaiians. We don't like to talk about that. I can name you family names. And they know for themselves and they are trying to repay that, that uh, error that they, they follow. You have some Hawaii families who know that their families also participated in the overthrow and they too want to repay. So we cannot allow too much of that history to just hang us up and ourselves try to justify our own racism. That's part of the dreaming. We've got to engage in what I call courageous discussion. Otherwise, we just sing into the choir and everybody go along and we run into more people here later on. So, there was one thing that we had to overcome. How we distinguish who is the Hawaiian nationals. And I think at this stage, we generally have consensus. Yes, Hawaiian nationals got to include everybody. That doesn't mean that everybody have indigenous rights. That's something else. We still need to protect the indigenous people. We need to protect our right to our language, our right to our education system, our right to our health system, all of those things that many of you have heard about and many of you are participating in. But it doesn't mean that we can ice out the non-native Hawaiians. One of my clients, that's, that's the only one. One client, when we were in jail, uh, he was in jail, I keep so busy. <laughs> and we sit in and we're talking together. And he says, what's happening in Hawaii? I said, well, we got the Hawaiian sovereignty movement. He said, yeah, tell me about it. How is it going? I said, well, you know, now we get uh, uh, this woman named Mama Loa. She says she's a queen. She follows from a calf cart line. And then you get, of course, uh, what's that, Sami Amalo, who says he's the king. And then you get uh, Peggy Howard Ross, who says she's, uh, she occupies a throne. And then you get a lot of other people standing up and saying, no, no, it's me. I get the genealogy, et cetera, et cetera. He says, that's terrific. In the meantime, my sky's in Hawaii. <laughs> We're grumbling about everybody claiming to be the Ali, right? He says, that's terrific. He said, this is what we got to do. We are on a train. This is called a sovereignty train. And every time we come across a new person, whatever you like to be, stop the train. Come on the train. Take your seat. Who you like to be? You like to be Kamehameha the 16? Go, go sit down. Be Kamehameha. And you, you want to be Lilio Kamehameha? Whoever, come sit down. The sovereignty train has to move ahead. It's not time for us to be fighting about this and that. We have to move as a nation. But remember that this track is not unirail, has two rails. One rail is the right, the dignity, the integrity of the indigenous people of Hawaii. The second rail is the right of all human beings to fundamental freedoms, to respect, to be treated appropriately, so that we stop this racist game. That for a time we did play, because we were still in the morning stage. Many of you may have been members of an organization that said, only the Poe Hawaii, leave everybody else out. Okay. So anyway, we grow into this consensus building from the dreaming stage. All the things that happen in the dreaming stage. One of the problems was this fear of freedom. Oh, how can we be free? You know, how are we going to survive economically? How are we going to survive uh, within the international community? How the, are we going to survive without the United States supporting us? Without Maxson bringing the ships in and all that stuff? As we talked about it, as we continue to consider these things, we have been able to look at some of the economic consequences. We look at, for example, about 30 years ago, they used to say, the federal government pour more money into Hawaii than they take out. 
So I said, well, a very interesting conclusion. So I called these bankers and these economists and I asked them, what are the factors that you threw into your formula to make this determination? Or we consider all the military spending, all the federal spending, all the spending for education that is poured into Hawaii, as opposed to how much taxes you pay to the federal government. Said, oh, okay. Have you considered how much land the feds have? One third of all of Hawaii and the best lands too? <coughs> have you put that into your factor? Oh, no, no, we never considered that. These are seeded lands. No, it's stolen lands. Look how many seeded lands. Have you considered that Makua, you pay $1 for 65 years for renting Makua? Oh no, we never considered that. Have you considered, and then you look at all of the other things that they never factored in. And so I say, well actually you don't know whether or not you really pay more money in, or they pay more money in than you're taking it out. Have you considered redoing your formula? No. Because the people who are paying them to come up with these conclusions don't want those things to be seen. They say, well, what about the Americans who come to Hawaii and pay uh, state taxes? Yeah, but what about the military who do all the shopping in uh, uh, on the military base? They pay absolutely nothing. So there's the whole reformulation, the new look, the new review that needs to be taken. So that today, people are saying, not only that, but on top of that, you have the uh, Law of the Sea Treaty that gives every nation 200 mile exclusive economic zone. Why do we give it to the Americans? It's ours. Those are things we can use. And, and switching the way we operate, let's say the East West Center. The East West Center should be an international education experience so that we can start training leaders for the world. But instead it's being used by the USAID who is a front for the CIA, and they use it for the East, to, the West, to spy into the East. And so as a result, it never moves forward with this kind of control. Hawaii can be independent. The only limitation we have is our own dreams, the inability to dream. So we have been able to overcome that. So people are not so afraid of freedom. That's part of the dreaming that has happened during the dreaming. The next part of the dreaming is this idea. You know, I, I, I do a radio program and brought over here, it's, it seems like the co-host, <laughs> Uncle Joe. <laughs> and we talk about all kinds of different stuff. But one of the stuff I always talk about is this. They talk about, you know all the Israelis? And they're going in and they're bombing the Gaza Strip and they're bombing the Palestinians and how bad the Israelis, the Jews are because of their basic uh, written document. And then you look at other places and what about the, the Germans and the way they were treating the Jews? Germany, a Christian nation. They were doing genocide. And then you look at the Islamic people and the kind of stuff that ISIS is now doing in in uh, Iraq and Syria. The issue is not the religion. The issue is how people interpret the religion through their eyes, through what is called deep culture. It's a deep culture that really determines how you behave. It's not the text. The deep culture in Hawaii is being led by three fundamental pillars. One, the pillar of domination. Two, the pillar of individualism. And three, the pillar of exclusion. Okay, domination, individualism, and exclusion. That's the way our economic system works. That's the way our political system works. That's the way our judiciary works. That's the way we educate our kids. It's filled with all of these kinds of stuff. The way we treat the environment. D-I-E, domination, individualism, and exclusion. If I get one pala pala and it says, I'm the owner of this land, it's my business whether or not I'm gonna cut that tree down or not. Because I have the right to dominate. It's mine, it's not yours. The community has nothing to say about it. But it provides shame, it provides joy for many of our people. That's okay, I get the pala pala. 
And if you look at many other systems that we have, education, okay, kids, sit, sit down quietly, separate. We're gonna have a pop quiz today. We have five questions, no cheating. Question one, two, three, four, five. So I'm sitting, I'm why not high school graduate, right? I'm sitting in the back of the, and usually all the Hawaiians are in the back of the class. So I'm sitting in the back of the class. Question number three. I don't know the answer, so Ho'ipo. Ho'ipo, what's the answer for question number three? The poka, the answer is, and then she begins to tell me the answer. But Ho'ipo talk loud, right? <laughs> so the teacher walk in the class. Say, Ho'ipo, what you doing? So Poka, he didn't know the answer for number three, so I gotta tell him the answer for number three. What? You're cheating. No, 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 we're not cheating. He don't know the answer, so I'm helping him so he can know what the answer is. You folks are cheating. You see the conflict in culture, how they elevate individualism, only the smart people, and yet when I'm sitting there, we try to share, this is the way our community work. You ring the bell, we're out in recess. The operation, the deep culture is totally different among our local people. Ring the bell again, they were gonna play the DIE culture again. And so they say, how come our kids so uh, <clears throat> schizophrenic? Because they keep bouncing us back and forth. You go home, you operate on a deep, deep, a different deep culture. We gotta start resolving what is a deep culture for Hawaii? What should it be? Is it domination, individualism, and exclusion? Or do we need to switch that deep culture? Instead of domination, it's olu olu. Okay, so we disagree. We had our points out. It's not I win or you win, I'm important. But have to be able to maintain our aloha for one another. So that we can continue operating with one another, continue to respect one another, and maybe continue to talk about this issue or some other issue. So instead of domination, it has to be olu olu. Instead of individualism, what about the idea of lokahi? You know that tree, we should all own that tree. It's not because you get a para para. And you know when you go fishing and you pull all, uh, or you go gather the limo, and then you take the rake and you start raking up all the limo koho. It's not appropriate, but it's my rake. Yeah, it's your rake, but it's not right. What about the other family who need to go gather later on? A different sense of deep culture. We have to switch back. So it's not individualism, it has to be lokai. Instead of exclusion, you're either with us or you're against us. If you're not part of our team, you're on the other side, you're the enemy. No, 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 we're all part of the same team. Instead of exclusion, it's aloha. We have to have aloha for everyone, bring everyone in, respect one another. So instead of die mentality, die deep culture, even the way we read our religious text, Instead of die, it has to be olo. Olo olo, lokahe, and aloha. I do radio sometimes. I interviewed uh, uh, Desmond Tutu when it came to Hawaii. So I asked him, isn't it the case that it all comes from the Christian religion that we get so many pilikia, so many trouble? You know, you look in the book of Genesis and God said, I give you dominion and control over this, this, and that. You can control all these things. And that is where it all started out, from the book of Genesis. And he looks at me and he very kindly, in essence, slaps me in the face. He said, no, brother, you're reading it in the wrong way. It needs to be read in a very God-like, loving manner. What is he saying? He says, it's a deep culture from which you look at these things. Very important. And in Hawaii, if, not if, when we achieve our independence, we also have to look at what is a substantial basis of our community, of our society. We need to make that switch, otherwise we're just acting like, you know, playing in the rat race. And yeah, now you will get Native Hawaiians who will win the rat race. But what, we all end up as rats. No, we need to make much deeper changes than that. The next issue is clarifying United States domestic law as opposed to an international perspective. And we have allowed, if we have allowed 
this clash to go on. I have been a participant in this clash okay, that divides our people. Some people say domestic law says that they will recognize us, federal recognition. The assumption is that if we get federal recognition, they cut the line for independence. When they propose the questions to us, are you in favor of integration or independence? And we believe that if we get federal recognition, then they cut the line to our quest for independence. The truth is, whether or not they give us federal recognition or not, they're still trying to cut the line for our independence. They've been doing that all along. I had been involved, I, I was a political spokesperson for the World Council of Indigenous Peoples. I worked at the United Nations. I spoke before the General Assembly of the United Nations. I'm very familiar with how the United States has operated. Whether or not they recognize or don't recognize they always say it's a domestic matter, it's our business, not you folks' business, so stay out. And what do we say? No, no, no. It's our business and it is an inter international matter. Irrespective of what the U.S. do in this case, oh, you know, we have given recognition to the native Hawaiian people. We are still going to be in there and we'll say, okay, good, now let's go to further step, our independence. That's the switch between this conjunction. We have been dividing ourselves with a conjunction O-R. Or, we divide our community, we divide our church, we divide our family. We ourselves are caught in a division. On one hand, I want to protect Hawaiian Homes programs. Mm -hmm. I want to protect scholarships that we are entitled to. I want to protect, and whatever the programs are, here's an expert about the different programs. But on the other hand, I don't want to give up my independence. I will never give up my independence. Now sometimes they try to pose a question to you. Either or, which way are you going to swing? And you tell them, a stupid question. I'm going to grab everything I can get. You know, I, I belong to an organization, we call it uh, Institute for the Advancement of Hawaiian People. Whether we advance in one way or the other way, we need to move ahead, just like the train track. We need to move ahead. Now, for too long, the community has been divided. Every time somebody talk about federal recognition, we make an assumption that they don't want independence. You check with the folks, talk to them, and you ask them the question, does it mean you don't want independence? Oh, no, 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 I still want to be an independent nation. But how are we going to do away with the scholarship that my children have? How are we going to quit Hawaiian homes and move out and join the homeless? What is the alternative that I have? And if we don't have the answer for them, then who are we to say, no, no, you got to choose? Why you got to choose? Why do we use the or conjunction rather than the and conjunction? Office of Hawaiian Affairs submitted a response to the Department of Interior. And what they said was, yes, we want federal recognition. But they said something else that not many people want to talk about. They said, and as it regards our international rights, we leave that for another day, for another forum, to be discussed later on. What they have done is jump a gap. Very recently, they jumped the gap of or, and they stopped now talking about and. We don't see it, they're not publicizing it, but the, the issue at that time was not to publicize it. They wanted to clarify exactly what they meant in terms of integration. But what it signals to us is even the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is seeing it as an and proposition rather than an or proposition. Okay, I, I know I've, I've talked a little bit too much, but I want to say one more thing. They talk about Kanayolo Valo, I'm against Kanayolo not because I don't think the Hawaiian people should have a choice. But 10, 12 years ago, we went through the same process. 
It was called a Native Hawaiian vote. Now what did we do? We went to every Native Hawaiian community. We fought it out. We were accused of being sellouts. We were going to uh, turn turn into state state officials and all that stuff. But other people were saying, you know, we sick and tired of people going to the United Nations and say, oh, I the king, I represent the you, the Hawaiian nation, I this, I that, and all that stuff. They said. It just so happens I wasn't invited to their party, their family party that elected them king or queen. <laughs> so how can they talk to say that they represent us? So this is what the consensus was. Let each community elect their own representatives and let the representatives put their head together and then come out with a proposal to the Hawaiian people. What kind of government you want? Integration? independence you tell us and then once you put it to us the native hawaiians can vote on their outcome i'm the chairman of that convention right now but the problem is they cut the line they cut the funding we were just on the on the verge of coming out with two proposals and in the paper you can go to that website and you can see the independence proposal okay we took a straw vote at the beginning most of the people were all over the place we have people very, very loyal to the United States. War heroes, Pinky Thompson, and, and many others who are very patriotic. They went through the Second World War. They understood all of that stuff. So they saw it from their point of view. From the other side, you had people such as myself, you had Bumpy, you had other groups who said, no, 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 we got to be independent. After studying the issue for a number of years, we finally took a straw vote and we said, okay, informally, how do we feel? The majority started swaying towards independence and not to nation within a nation. The Native Hawaiian Convention is not allowed to complete its action because the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and the state legislature has not funded it anymore. They said, no, we're drawing back. And then our great Hawaiian leaders in the, in the Senate and in the House voted a new thing, and this is called Kanaya Oluvalu. In other words, to interrupt the fulfillment of our task, we are right on the verge of coming out with two proposals, an independence proposal and an integration proposal. And what I'm trying to push for is that when you vote, you can vote for integration, you can vote for independence, you can vote for both. Well, you can turn down both and say neither. That is a kind of option that we need to start switching our minds into. As I said before, our Hawaiian people have been divided for far too long over one simple, stupid conjunction, OR, OR. We are not OR people. It has to be AND. We have to accept people who disagree with us as part of our family. Only until we unite, we probably don't deserve to have a nation because all we're doing is borrowing the problems again. We need to respect the integrity of every person to want to move through their vision how the Hawaiian advancement needs to take place. And it's when I say Hawaiian in this case, it's not only the koko, it's the people who make up Hawaii who we decide should be citizens of our Hawaiian nation. Otherwise, we're going to be struggling forever, disagreeing with one another. And you know what the problem also is? That the Howlers, the Portuguese, the Japanese, the Filipinos, and everybody else, they're essentially waiting until the Hawaiians get to act together. That what they are saying is, oh, it's not my kuleana, so I'm not going to vote. Only until we pull this together, then we can give leadership then you can really get movement in Hawaii. So at times we ourselves become the stumbling block because of our po'opakiki, our honor. So that's what I wanted to present to you, maybe shifting the paradigm slightly so you get some of these understandings. The rest of the paper I, I distributed out there, there's some references of how you can get to some of the documents that I've talked about. Thank you for your audience. I got a question. Sure.
song of sovereignty wherever you may be. Throw your voice upon the wind and let it ring. Join the voices of the ages in ancient melody. It's a song you should not be afraid to sing It's a song that was written by our 